Grace and peace. My name is Ryan. I'm the movie pastor, and I'm doing a new thing uh, where I invite some of my friends who are preachers or spiritual leaders or just interesting people, um, and they share with me about their favorite movie, and I talk to them about how we might think theologically about that film. I've got my friend Shane here. He is a pastor up in the Northeast, and I'm excited to speak to him about the best movie ever. Shane, what is the best movie ever? I believe the best movie ever is Spirited Away. Uh, it is, would you like me to say more about it? Say more about Spirited Away, yeah. So some basics about it. It's a 2001, 2002-ish uh, movie, depending on whether you got to watch it in Japan or here in the United States. Uh, by Studio Ghibli, and uh, that's a studio that's known for a number of top-tier um, Japanese animation films, uh, including My Neighbor Totoro, Princess Mononoke, uh, whole on and on, uh, hit after hit with a, uh, it's been compared to Pixar in terms of just the, the number and quality of these movies, and I believe Spirited Away is really their crown jewel. Uh, it's, it combines a lot of the themes that the studio is named, or is, sorry, is known for uh, in a, with a good mix of action, of uh, really quiet, haunting, and beautiful moments, uh, and a message that I think really is universal. Okay, yeah, so I, I mean, I was familiar. I had seen one of the, I call them the Miyazaki films, right? Because yes. Hideko Miyazaki. Hayao Miyazaki. Hayao Miyazaki. Yeah, uh, is is, is like oh, yeah. thank you. Um, he he's like the mastermind who who puts these films together, and he's retired like six times now. Um, <laughs> so I'd seen Ponyo, and okay. I didn't love it. Right. And and now I finally got around to Spirited Away. I know I'm supposed to see you know Howl's Moving Castle and My Neighbor Totoro, but I gotta say after seeing two of them, I don't know if it's for me. Like, I. I, I had a weird experience watching it. I felt like like there were moments that were really cool. I thought the ducks were hilarious that were just like in between in these weird scenes and so on. Um, but man, the plot was so wild. Like, so the plot of this movie, everything I do on Movie Pastor is, is spoiler alert, of course, right? right? So if you haven't seen this film, see it first. Um, but it, this is about a girl who gets lost and then is helped by a young boy who turns out is a dragon, but well, the dragon a river spirit. is a river. Yes. <laughs> so uh, for uh, folks who haven't seen or who need to be reminded of it, uh, Chihiro is a young girl, probably about nine or 10, who in the beginning of the movie is moving to a new town with her parents. Uh, they take a wrong turn and end up uh, driving down a uh, forested country road and get to what they think is an abandoned theme park. Uh, but it turns out that it's actually uh, a bathhouse for the spirits. Now, for those of you who know something about Japanese mythology, uh, Shintoism in particular, uh, now there's some debates over how much Shintoism is actually a religion as it's practiced now. But in uh, Japanese mythology and Shintoism, uh, there are kami, which are little gods with a, with a lowercase g instead of one big god. Uh, and they inhabit their local spirits uh, that inhabit uh, the world. There's little roadside shrines. You'll see, still see those in uh, Japan today. And uh, this is a, uh, a bathhouse for the spirits, a place where they can go uh, that is a literally a safe place for them, a safe space for them away from the corrupting influence of humanity. Uh, multiple times you'll hear spirits say something about uh, the stink of humanity, uh, which I think is, is wonderful. Um, it's and, they're, they're washing that off at the bathhouse. Right. And what I think uh, a connection that most people don't know is that that's actually relatively close, I think, to what Paul's religious worldview would have been. Paul, of course, talks about the powers and principalities, uh, the elemental spirits of the world. He and his worldview and his religious uh, life would have also acknowledged, not worship, but acknowledged uh, other minor powers that uh, inhabited the world, the winds, uh, things like that. Of course, it was the role of Christ to uh, to conquer and put under heel those spirits, which often meant ill for humanity. Not always, though. 
So I wanted to make that, that is a connection between uh, Paul's worldview uh, and the worldview that the Japanese uh, in, in many ways still have. Okay, well, so you just took this discussion up to 11 <laughs> really fast, um, which I love. I mean, I mean, I think one of the beautiful things about YouTube is it's a place where you can kind of uh, speak at the level you want to speak and find your audience, right? Right. Um, and so, that, but just uh, because I watched this whole film um, and I paid attention to it because I want to look smart on this video and it's not working. Um, I did not get that the theme park was really a bathhouse for the spirits. I... I was under the impression that like she was wandering around a theme park and then we entered like a dream sequence. But this no, like, I, whole thing yeah. is, is the same literal experience in your mind. Right. So it's the yeah, same. That, it I mean, it's, makes more sense. Well, it's kind of, and, and here's the thing too, is there's- It all kinda, really happened. Interplay between the physical and the spiritual. Uh, at right. the end of the film, if you notice, they came back. Uh, Chihiro still had her little band that she had got. Yes. Or hair bands. So something had happened. And also there was dust in the car. Yes. So there's the, the time something passed. weird in, in was going on in time. Now, I don't think that they would have come back. I still think they would have been a little bit late for the movers. I don't think three days in the physical world may have actually happened in that way. But time somehow passed. Yeah. Um, and we're not really given a full explanation of that. And that's okay. There's, uh, sure. you know, if you... If you've heard but, about but I mean, Latin to, say, to say that something happened in the spiritual world, right? Like, obviously, weird stuff goes on in the movie, right? There's an old lady with a giant head who turns into a raven. Like, it's, a, right. it's, it's weird. Um, but to say that that's part of reality, it's a spiritual part of reality, but it's still a part, like, it's connected to, um, to, to <laughs> parts of experience that exist um, even after she goes home. Uh, that, it, you know small spirits, local spirits are around and they're doing things. She might not interact with them as directly. She's not at the bathhouse anymore, but it's it's real to her. And I'm, I'm guessing that's also where you, you might go later is that's also a Christian connection I think we can make there theologically. Um, our encounters with, with Jesus Christ, um, even if they appear on a spiritual level, at a certain point, we do go back to the secular world. However, it is a different place for us. Yeah. Um, uh, and, and Christians encounter, we're supposed to at least encounter the world in a different way. And I think that sort of experience is very similar to what she has too. So I've seen the movie a number of times, which is probably why I kind of get the plot a little bit more, um, quite honestly, um, which I'm happy to watch it multiple times because I enjoy the beauty <laughs> of it so much, the aesthetics of it. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, in this bathhouse, uh, she encounters a number, uh, she over, un, uh, she under, sorry she undergoes a number of challenges and trials she meets really interesting characters including like a race of frog spirits which kind of remind me of the french i know we're not supposed to call the french frogs but i think of that uh i don't know if that uh, sometimes racism exists in movies that's uh yeah <laughs> um and it seemed then, like, uh, like the men were frogs and the women were something else right they were humanish, but they had weird uh, slightly off proportions like something was just a little bit off um, you're right. That's that's a good uh, uh, that's a good observation. Um, there are other yeah. The men were mostly monsters, but there's also um, the yeah. And there's there's one person. moment when yeah. one of the women is like, oh, this is frog work. You know, this like right. Uh, so there's a little bit of gender role species play going on. Um, right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So there's this. It's this very traditional in some ways uh, space. Uh, in the terms of the gender segregation uh, and the, the racial segregation, as if we can call it that, that exists within the bathhouse. Mm -hmm. uh, now, of course, it is ruled or oversaw by uh, someone who at least codes female, uh, the granny does. Right. Uh, however, her connection to femininity, I think, is she is as uh, female as she is human. I, I think... Um, so, sure. I mean, I don't think we need to go into patriarchy and things like that. I did not prepare for a, a gender analysis of this film. Um, yeah. But there's, there's differences in there, too. Uh, but anyway, she undergoes all these trials, uh, and she is changed by the end of the movie. Uh, and I think uh, there, there's two 
encounters that I kind of want to lift up. I'm not sure how you've been doing these, but the two encounters and characters that I would love to lift up. The first is her encounter with No Face, who is that spirit that spirit that's clad all in black, but has the kind of uh, I think it's a No uh, from the Japanese theater kabuki mask uh, mm -hmm. on his face, that white stylized mask, um, which is really a uh, if you remember in the film, he all he wants is to kind of have attention, to be noticed and loved, and that turns into um, because he is un he does not understand interactions between social interactions. Um, he takes that to mean that to get noticed and to be understood uh, involves uh, money. It's a transactional thing, uh, and that when he gives away more, he takes more. Uh, mm -hmm. And so he becomes the spirit of greed uh, and a transactional relationship. Uh, and that ends up making him sick. I believe that's what Chihiro says. Uh, being in the bathhouse was bad for him. Uh, and that makes me think a little bit about sin um, and how sometimes uh, it is the location and our circumstances, uh, which sin is, of course, you know, within us, but uh, the the locations and the circumstances we're in can cause it to really fester and, and grow into something really, really unhealthy that ends up consuming us uh, in, in, in really bad ways. Uh, so and, so No Face by, by default was sort of a, a, a neutral, lonely spirit, right? Was, I think was so. Was excluded yeah. from the spirit world. Um, but then Chiro let, let him in and he had the opportunity to help her and that got him mixed up into just a context he didn't really belong. Right, and one that, and I think this is even more true, he, it rewarded his worst impulses. Mm -hmm. Because when he gave out the gold, he was seen as like, oh, this is a rich client. We have to keep pleasing him, keep pleasing him, keep pleasing him, uh, so he can give us more gold. That, and uh, uh, it feeds those worst impulses. Yeah. Uh, uh, so I think that's a, a, a really uh, telling uh, thing, a telling scene in that. And he finds peace uh, at towards the end of the movie with simple, honest work to help uh, Zababa, Granny's sister, twin sister, uh, mm -hmm. help her with her sewing um, in a simple place where uh, he is seen as a, I don't know, I guess a person, not a human, but a person. Um, yeah. And that's recognized. And you, you talked about the gender analysis. Um, but yeah, where, where Zababa, it's Zababa's sister says to Chihiro, call me Granny or call me Nana now. Right. Um, that was that was an interesting moment. I watched it um, with I watched it both dubbed and subtitled because I was interested in the, the kind of yeah. translation that went on. Um, but yeah, there is that aspect of uh, of, of maternalism there, uh, operating as a a sweet old granny versus operating as a a, a ruler or a, a queen of this society of bathhouse workers. Um, and that's and that's a stock character in a lot of Miyazaki films is the good granny. Um, mm. So uh, 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 Japan has, of course, a, is a aging society and has a great deal of cultural respect towards the elder, towards the elderly and elders. So the the friendly granny who looks out for uh, the younger child uh, who might not even be her own uh, is is definitely a. a, a a trope in a bunch of Miyazaki movies and through a lot of other Japanese media. So, so tell me about that other interaction. You said there was a, a second interaction that you were interested in kind of sharing about. Yeah, and, uh, and that's with uh, her friend, the river spirit, uh, Hoku, mm -hmm. uh, Koho, the Kohoku River. So um, dragons in kind of East Asian mythology, you may or may not know this, um, aren't associated with fire, they're associated with air and water, primarily. Uh, so dragons as river beings. Uh, in Chinese mythology, uh, one of the great dragons lives under the ocean, for example. So 
they go more into that path rather than kind of the Western European image of the dragon. Um, and uh, the, the thing that I really wanted to point out, especially theologically, was the relationship that they had by the end. Uh, I think is a perfect encapsulation, and you've done much more Greek study than me, so feel free to correct me, of kind of agape love. Uh, mm. It's not a romantic love that they share, at least not at this point. Um, there are enough differences. I don't think it was coded romantically. Uh, but those bonds of mutual obligation that they care for one another, uh, that they have literally saved each other's lives, in a sense. Uh, uh, it, and it forms a, a, a bond between them that is stronger uh, than if it were, say, a, a simple love, uh, like a romantic love scene. Um, so I wanted to put that out there as um, many, uh, many movies uh, have a character seeking fulfillment through a romantic relationship, which I think is actually really unhealthy if we have that as how salvation or fulfillment comes to a character. But with the development of this sort of relationship, this agape love relationship, that puts a different spin on uh, what a fulfilling relationship could look like in a movie. See, that's another that's another kind of twist, and that's why th this format is so interesting to me because because y'all go insightful places that I would never go. I, I I mean, certainly there were lines in the movie where, like, this spider guy I forget his name, the guy who worked in the mm -hmm. boiler room, yeah, said they're in love, um, right? Like, only love can break that spell. Um, but you go to Greek which is a place we as theologians are familiar with kind of there being translation differences. Um, right. And most Christians by this point have heard some sermon or read C.S. Lewis's The Four Loves to right. be exposed to the idea that there's, that there's multiple senses of the word love in English and there are different words in different languages. Um, <laughs> but yeah, that, that makes so much more sense that the love that they're talking about isn't, uh, isn't eros, isn't romantic love, but it's, something else, whether agape or I, I, I'd argue even philia, even even mm -hmm. brotherly love, yeah. um, to, to come alongside and have the sincere love of friendship. Um, yeah, that's, that's something I, I didn't catch. Yeah, I mean, I've, I said, I've watched the movie multiple times and I thought about it. Uh, yeah, and, and th what those kind of the, love do they have? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think there's also a lot of, um, Kind of reckoning with the past, I think, mm -hmm. is a big is a big theme in the movie too. Uh, and of course, environmentalism. Environmentalism. Uh, one of Miyazaki's previous movies, My Neighbor Totoro, back in the '80s, uh, was actually uh, some people credit it with kicking off the ja the Japanese environmental movement. Uh, kind of this uh, rediscovery of the natural world, its beauty the semi-supernatural aspects or awe that, and reverence that we should have for it. Um, that's, so I don't know if you read if, how much reading you did about the movie, but if you, there was the, uh, when the, the nasty, what they thought was a mud spirit came in. And, mm -hmm. The stink uh, spirit, yeah. The stink spirit. And Chihiro, actually, they start pulling things out from it uh, and they pull out a bicycle. Uh, that was actually inspired by a real life event that happened to Hayao Miyazaki, uh, where he went to a river cleanup day and there was, they pulled out a bike from the river. Uh, and I thought that was such a cool uh, representation of, the, of once again, these side-by-side -side worlds, uh, how that might feel like an infected wound inside a uh, living embodiment of the river. Yeah. Yeah, that, that was one of those moments, you know, uh, Zababa says, I thought so. Um, and, and you feel like, was that a reference to something? But it turns out it's a reference to, to Miyazaki's own life. That's, yeah, how we, how we pile things on. Well, we should draw to a close because I don't, I don't want to, um, <laughs> I, I want to leave people wanting more. But I, I want to return you, if I can, to where we were at the beginning when you talked about uh, the spirits within Shintoism. And I think for a lot of, of Christian viewers, um, when we see other religions depicted or illustrated in movies, we sometimes think uh, verboten, we, you know, off limits, let's not go there. Um, but I, I think where you went is really interesting um, to say that there are, and, and there were within the New Testament 
worldview and theology and context uh, small gods. And, and, and I'm, I'm willing to say the word that they used for those small gods. It was, it was daimons, right? Demons. Um, it, it, to me, it was a, I, I mean, you might even compare it to Chihiro's experience to walk around the ruins of Turkey um, mm. and, and be immersed in an ancient Roman Near Eastern society and look at their, their artwork to find that the small gods they were worshiping were things like uh, liberty, brotherhood, earth, um, the, the continent of Anatolia was one of them, right? Like, um, yeah. it, it wasn't, um, it, it, it's stuff we don't believe, in. money, right? Fortune, uh, Fortuna is a, a small god. I mean, good thing that that doesn't happen today, that people don't worship money. I mean, that never happens, so. Yeah, <laughs> I, I think so often we get into this, uh, this way of thinking where like, oh, that just nothing is real. God is the only God that exists, and therefore nothing else is real. Um, but if, if God is the real kind of real, right? God isn't just the only thing right. in this separate spiritual category of reality, but is in fact actual and and a part of the real experience of the real world then the other things that are a part of the real experience of the real world are a part of our experience of the spiritual world so Mm -hmm. yeah uh, the nation right Uh, uh, columbia yeah sex yeah money these these are are small gods and there's there are spiritual elements to them and there is great peril if we uh, if we start to worship them, or in other ways, if we if we disrespect them and fail to fail to recognize kind of where they belong and where they don't belong. You start putting those things where they don't belong, they get sick, and soon after that, we get sick. I, I uh, so once again, this, and I don't want to go on too long. I could talk about this forever. But, um, so one, there's a great book by someone who is a professor of mine in seminary. He's now uh, teaching at Yale, Mark Heim, who does a lot of his work on Trinitarian theology. He's the Baptist, but he's one of the good Baptists. Um, uh, and he does a lot of work also with interreligious dialogue and what Trinitarianism, Trinitarian theology means for uh, interreligious dialogue. And I didn't actually read the whole book. Sorry, Mark. But um, he wrote a book that had a very interesting thesis. And he said for the Western, especially Western liberal mindset, our default, and this ties in exactly to what you said, is to, is to take a look at other religions' truth claims and their worlds and believe that they are not true, that they cannot be true that the, the mutual exclusivism, and this doesn't, and I, I will say as a preface, this doesn't mean syncretism in any way. So we might say, like, for example, if we were to look at a Buddhist practitioner, we would say the hunt for nirvana is a false one. That is the, the, might be the typical thing. Mark Himes, his, Professor Himes, uh, what he introduced and got me thinking about it is what if we were to think of them as all true? So what if the Buddhist actually is going after nirvana? How does Christian heaven then compare to the Buddhist conception of nirvana? Mm -hmm. What similarities are there and what differences are there? And that makes for a much more interesting conversation, interreligious conversation. Uh, So here, once again, looking into the spirit world and the, the interplay with materiality in the spirit. And I thought you were going to go into a communion argument or a communion thing here uh, about the bread and the, the food that uh, they, the parents eat. And... Well, no, about our Christian practice. Mm. Uh, and that connection when you said materiality and that's reflection almost in the spiritual world um, and how they're inter- intertwined with one another. Um, and a lot of how Christians view communion is based on how they believe those spirit worlds and the spirit world of the spiritual and the world of the material interact. If we if we think about it, um, but but the other thing, sorry, that goes into that is I took and I don't I hope this is a good place for us to end. I took a class 
uh, when I was in college, and I still remember this, so this was 15 years ago, my freshman year of college, 16 years, and it was about the African-American experience in the United States, the Western African diaspora, an anthropology class. And they said that one of the most terrifying things for the recently enslaved people who came over was that the, the magical spiritual practices that they had developed and were, which were so real to them did not work on their white masters. Mm. And that was existentially terrifying for that first generation of enslaved folks. And that actually gave the white folks a, an aura of power which others in their, their even their slave owners, other uh, slave owners in the Af their West African context did not have. So thinking about what is true, what is false in that spiritual world, that the white man did not seem to inhabit that spiritual world at all, uh, was deeply unsettling. Yeah. Man, there's, there's so, so much we could go into with that um but you're right we'll we'll stop talking about uh spirited away and and start talking about the the ethics of slavery and and move from there into slave theology right and, and to white supremacy uh, oh. and its connection to science and uh, scientism and all those other things and and uh, who would have thought that all that was connected to a, a cartoon about a 10 year old yeah exactly well, Shane, thank you so much for talking to me. We'll we'll have to have some some more conversations offline uh, very shortly. But let's uh, let's wrap this up. And before uh, our viewers sign off, I want to ask you. Um, so you're a pastor. So you're doing stuff in the midst of COVID. You're doing stuff online. Will you do me a favor and plug yourself? What are some exciting things you're doing? If my viewers are exposed to Shane, they they want to see more of your analysis, your theology, your thoughts. Where would they look? So I have my own YouTube channel. We'll put that in the Dibbly Do, I think is what the, the proper YouTube name. That's, for that's the YouTuber word we use. Yep. <laughs> the Dibbly Do. Uh, I've been doing, uh, I'm, an, I, I'm an interim pastor up in Connecticut. Um, and we together have been doing uh, worship. I've been making worship guides and doing sermon videos. Uh, so those I have available. That's been my primary online presence. Um, I'm working to get a Facebook page up, but I currently don't have anything on it. Uh, so maybe at some point there might be, uh, but those are my big things. Uh, and uh, yeah, I, it's been a pleasure to uh, to get to know you, Ryan, over the past uh, couple of years. We met through Discord, through online chat forums. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, thank you for having me on. Uh, thank you for uh, for bearing with me and for really creating this new forum by by being a guinea pig and figuring out the tech aspects of it. I'll uh, I'll see you soon and i'll see you all next time all Bye. right thank you see ya <laughs> all right i'm turning that off